Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Today's show brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Before we get to Chuck Hickson, let's get to the play by play call of the day. Now the 2 1 pitch. Swung on, line down the left field line. Ozuna coming over, dives, he didn't get it. It bounds away. Hoskins has scored. Santana coming around third. He's going to score. The ball's still on the warning track, and the Phillies have won it. Aaron Altair has snapped an 0 for 12. Here in the bottom of the 10th inning, he's won it for the Phillies. Marcel Ozuna with a full out dive couldn't come up with it. And even worse for the Cardinals, he let it get by him. And both runners score, and the Phillies get up off the deck, and they have beaten St. Louis in the bottom of the 10th, 6 to 5, the final. Scott Fransky with the call on the Phillies radio network and heard on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Big win for the Phillies last night. And with that, we transition to Chuck Hickson, phillybaseballinsider.com. Chuck, welcome back. Great to have you with us. Oh, good to be back with you guys again. Okay, Chuck, uh, just last night and uh, what they were able to do, what does that do for a ball club when you do that? Well, that, that's huge. You know, they... They blew it last night. You know, it looked like that was over. The bullpen came in. Nick Pavetta pitched a, a great game, and it, it looked, you know, like like they, it was going to go down as a loss. And when St. Louis gets that run in the top of the tenth, then you figure it's definitely done. And Aaron Altair, of all guys, as, as Scott Fransky said, you know, he's he's really been scuffling, and he was only in the lineup because Nick Williams got hurt. It was just improbable. And you pull one out like that, it can do a lot for a ball club, especially a young team that that needs those wins like that. All right, you talked about the bullpen. Look, there are a lot of bullpens that are really not great. St. Louis is a perfect example of that. They're yeah. really trying to find some combination right now. Where's the Phillies bullpen? Uh, where do they settle right now in your in your mind? Well, you know, it was supposed to be a strength of the team because they they went out, they got Tommy Hunter, they got Pat Neshek back during the off season. Uh, you know, they had Hector Neris, who had 26 saves last year. It was supposed to be a pretty good part of this ball club. Uh, and then Hector Neris comes out, he's not what he was last year. Neshek still hasn't pitched. Uh, Tommy Hunter opened the year on the DL. Some young guys have had some good moments. I mean, Sir Anthony Dominguez is is great. Um, Adubre Ramos has pitched really well. Uh, but it, it, they've really fallen apart. And it's tough to have a bunch of young guys now that you're really leaning on in key spots. Uh, Dominguez was not available last night. He pitched in the two games previous, so he wasn't going to be pitching. Uh, and it's really a question mark now. Uh, they'd like to get Neshek back. He started throwing again, but still hasn't started a rehab assignment. Uh, so it's going to be a, at least a couple more weeks till he's back. Uh, it's it's not good. Uh, you know, it is it is something that they really need to find some answers for. What were your thoughts, and and what are your thoughts on what you've seen of late of Nick Pavetta? Uh, he is young yet, and he is still going through a phase where he's learning how to really win ball games. I mean, he looked great last night, career high thirteen strikeouts, uh, but he still has moments. You know, in his three starts before that, he was just horrible. <laughs> so it's it's up and down, and that's the key with this team, not just with Pavetta, but you've got so many young guys where consistency is going to be an issue and when they struggle they can struggle mightily uh, but at times they're going to look really good 
And I, I think that if they're patient with them, they'll find that they have some, some good young players that are going to help them for a long time. Um, Pavetta is one of them. It's just a matter of, you know, learning how to win. And, and sometimes you have to go out there when you don't have your best stuff and win. Now, last night he had everything working for him. Uh, but the, the trick is on those nights when you don't have all of those pitches going for you, how do you win on those nights you know, and, and make it through six innings or whatever you can give your club? And that's what some of these young guys are still trying to figure out. It would not be a sure thing that it would happen. But if the Phillies were given a proposal that involved Manny Machado, how seriously should they consider it? In my mind, only if they're given a window to negotiate with Machado and sign him long term, uh, because they're not in a situation where renting a player for a few months is going to do them any good. Uh, the prospects that they would have to give up to get Machado, uh, I think, would be prohibitive. And if you're not going to get him signed long term and know that he's going to stay in Philadelphia, which, of course, would probably push the price up a little bit even higher. Uh, but you you can't give away prospects for any player right now and really feel like you're doing the right thing uh, for just a couple of months, especially with the type of prospects that it would take to get Machado. I mean, they're, they're going to start with Scott Kingery. Uh, they're going to probably want, uh, you know, maybe a Nick Pavetta, in there, and and you can't do that for renting a ball player for for a couple of months. For a couple of months, yes, but if they sign him long term, absolutely. Because I'll be yeah. frank with you, Chuck. I mean, I've looked I've looked at the research over the years. I'm telling you right now, the veteran player prospects be nothing. I mean, look mm -hmm. look at Hunter Pence. What did they give up for Hunter Pence? I mean, really. And then what did they acquire for Hunter Pence? That's yeah. eight players. None of them are as good as Hunter Pence. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. If you can, you know, get an assurance that you can sign Machado long term, yes. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it may be nicer if you could just get him through free agency. Um, but yeah, yeah, you can give up prospects if you're going to sign him long term. He's a great ball player, and he would bring so much to this ball club. Um, but you know, you don't want to give up those key players if it's only going to be for a couple of months. Uh, now, that part I understand. I understand that part. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I want to ask you about some of the young players, though. Crawford, Kingery, in particular. Mm -hmm. Where are they right now? Uh, they still need work. I I was a little bit surprised that Kingery opened the year on the 25-man on the roster. I don't think it would have hurt him to be at AAA for at least a few more months. I thought the plan with him would be that they would send him to Lehigh Valley and work on trying to trade uh, either Cesar Hernandez or Michael Franco and then bring him up. Uh, you know, J.P. Crawford, I wasn't surprised that he started in Philly. Uh, but they, they both still need some work. I think they're going to be good ball players, especially Kingery. Um, but you know they they're they're very young and and they need some more work and they're learning on the job basically um so i think they're okay but it, you know the, again that consistency just isn't there see that it goes back to my point i have no problem dealing prospects i have none at all. Uh, I watched the Red Sox. Chris Sale had three more years to go in Chicago. They dealt four guys mm -hmm. for him. Which one, of the, which one of the four is Chris Sale? Oh, I, 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 I'm right there with you uh, as long as it's not just for a couple of months. Right. You know, no, and I, Phillies yeah. are at, yeah, I, get, Phillies I get the are rental part. Stage. You know, yeah. the Phillies are at that stage where they could make a move like that and and get in, you know, a quality player uh, and they have some good prospects that haven't even hit the majors yet that they could certainly put together some impressive packages for, uh, you know, a Machado or, or anyone else that they would want to go after. 
Um, but, but it's got to be a long-term deal with the right. guy you acquire, and I completely right. agree with that. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's got to be a guy that you know either he already has a contract for the next couple of years or you get that window to negotiate, and he says, I want to be in Philadelphia, and I'll sign long-term. Let's do this, and let's win. Uh, how did you feel about the draft part of it? I mean, I, we know it's years away as to any of these guys getting there, like Mickey Moniak still on high A, for goodness sakes. I mean, <laughs> and there's a 250 hitter down there. I mean, that was years ago. Hazy's not a yeah. bad prospect. Now, now you got these guys. What was the general feeling about uh, how they picked? I, I think they did okay. They, you know, they lost a couple of high draft picks uh, from signing Arietta and signing Santana. So with the picks that they had, I think that they did all right. Alec Baum, I think, is going to be a, a quality player. Uh, a lot of the Phillies people think he can stick at third base. Some scouts believe he's going to wind up a, as a corner outfielder. But he definitely has some power. And I've talked to a couple of uh, scouts from other ball clubs who have seen him play, and they mentioned Reese Hoskins. You know, they said that they see a lot of Hoskins in Alec Bohm. And, and if they wind up with a player like that, uh, yeah, I think that they did well. You know, the other guys are, are all going to be projects. You know, after you get through the first few picks, you've, you know, you're just making a project and, and you hope that it's the guy that can work out. Every now and then you get a guy in a lower round that, that turns out to be pretty good. But I think that they did okay, especially considering that they didn't have a lot of those those top picks uh, to go with. Interesting, though, that, that Bomb, if my understanding is right, Chuck, he took less than his slot, which then gave yeah. him more money to distribute, correct? Yeah, um, they had a couple of high school kids that were probably going to head back and, and go to college. And the Phillies were able to say, well, you know what? We can up the offer. We can give you above slot money. And, of course, Major League Baseball has a, a plan in, in all of these these rookie contracts where if you basically you don't make it, your college is still paid for. So the Phillies were able to say, look, you know, worst-case scenario – you're just postponing your college, and we're going to give you more money up front. And they were able to sign a couple of guys, um, and Alec Bohm had no problem with that. So, you know, I, I like that from a player that you know doesn't hold out. He he didn't even hold out to get slot money. He was like, yeah, sure, you know, I, I want to get out there and I want to start playing. And I admire that. I mean, yeah. he's still getting. He's, it's not. He did not take a vow of poverty, but he's. Uh, right. I like what he did. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. You know, he he's still going to be okay. Uh, he's not going to be picking his meals from the dollar menu. You know, <laughs> uh, you know. But but he's out there playing. And and one thing you cannot get back is time. That's and right. the experience that he's going to get from every game that he gets to play this season is going to make up for that money that he left on the table. Chuck, what's, uh, you know, we all know that uh, the first week of the season was not exactly smooth sailing for Gabe Kapler. There's really <laughs> been nothing about him since. Uh, obviously, they've got a handle on some things. How has he grown into the job? He's gotten much better. Uh, you know, I that first week really was a disaster. I mean, people in Philly were calling for his head after, you know, half of that opening day game when he lifted Aaron Nola. Uh, he's gotten much better. I still think he relies a little too heavily on the analytics. Uh, yeah, I, I like a manager who will use those analytics, yep. but also is going to say, you know what, my gut tells me I'm going to pinch hit here. Or my gut, my gut tells me, yeah, don't go with the numbers in this situation. Yeah, if if it's all just numbers, then put a computer in the dugout and let it spit out what you're going to do. Uh, and and I think that he's starting to see that that he's got to put some of his knowledge into it instead of just you know, the computer says do this in this situation. I absolutely agree with that answer. Uh, one final note, and then I'll let you move on, Chuck. I ask you about Franco. Why is it in the last couple of years he, in a lot of ways, has stalled? 
Uh, boy, good question. Um, you know, he early, when he was in the minors, um, Andres Blanco was a big influence on him. The Phillies purposely put their lockers side by side because Franco was able to get in, was able to learn a lot from Andres Blanco. And, you know, they both told the story of in spring training, uh, Franco showed up late one day for practice. And before the manager or anybody could get to him, Andres Blanco basically said, I got this. And he went over to Michael Franco and said, you do not show up late for practice. You do not disrespect your teammates like that. And, you know, there was even some talk that one of the reasons Andres Blanco was on the Phillies was because he was so good with Franco. Uh, he just, he's got all the talent in the world. And I wonder if maybe, uh, you know, he seemed like a much better player the last couple of games, offensively and defensively. And I wonder if maybe sitting him down for a few games and saying, you know what, we're playing Crawford at third, that he may be the kind of player that needs that type of message, which is unfortunate. Uh, I still think he can be a pretty good ball player, but it's just a head thing. Um, and, you know, there are some players that never get over that. Yeah, Chuck, I hate when you have to shock a guy into being good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, there are players that are like that. Um you know, I'll never forget with the the Braves, Andrew Jones um, in center field, just yeah. really, you know, lollygagged after a ball. And in the middle of the inning, Bobby Cox pulled him out of the game and said, sit down, you're not going to play like that. And it changed Andrew Jones' career. And some guys just need that wake-up call. It's a shame, like you said, especially these guys that have all this talent you know, and they can't run out of ground ball. They can't, you know, dive for a ball. And it's like a lot of players will tell you, the one thing that you should never slump at is hustling. And and it's true. Yeah. It's interesting because I remember Brian Johnson, who ended up being a great receiver here, he ended up being a first-round pick by the Arizona Cardinals in the NFL. He's drop, 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 drop. So Joe Paterno switched him over to corner. And the first day he was like, okay. The second day he was still there, he went, uh-oh. Third day he was still there, and he looked around and said, wait a minute, this is permanent. And suddenly he got back on offense. <laughs> they shocked him into being a great wideout. You know, some guys need that. And, and you know, it's hard to explain why, uh, but some guys need that. And, and Franco might be that type of player that needs that mm -hmm. shock every now and then to say, wait a minute, you know, I can lose my job. Yeah. Absolute pleasure, Chuck. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for the information. All right. You guys take care and have a great day. You too. That is Chuck Hickson, phillybaseballinsider.com. Always does great work. We will come back with more in a moment, brought to you by Sunbury Motors, as we continue on News Radio 1070 WKOK. When you have America's best value, who needs balloons? Gimmicks. This lottery ticket can win you a brand new car. Or over promises on what your trade is worth. Get $5,000 just for your piece of junk. At Sunbury Motors Kia, value is all you need. It's America's Best Value Summer Event. And right now, there's no better value than 20 new 2018 Kias for under 20 grand. You heard right. Sunbury Motors Kia has 20 new 2018 Kia Rios, Optima Souls, and Fortes for under 20 grand. It was so popular last month, they're doing it again. Plus, all include Kia's 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. And you have to stop by SMC to check out their selection of certified pre-owned Kias. It's America's Best Value at Sunbury Motors Kia. Routes 11 and 15, Hubble's Wharf. Offer expires 63018. Warranty is a limited powertrain warranty. For details, see retailer or go to Kia.com. Well, off the air, I have to admit that we've had an odd linkage of names. Who would ever have thought that the the names Ben Hogan and the suit would be in the same sentence? <laughs> 
I was getting a little concerned there. I thought we were going to go back in time to a Ben Hogan story where he took the chutter out of the bag, and I don't know. I would have had. I may have walked out of the room. I, that the one it's to be the one time I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> no, no. I, the story goes that Claude Harmon, Butch Harmon's grandfather, hole in one at the Masters at the par three twelfth hole, and he was partnered with Ben Hogan. So Hogan goes up, boom, knocks in his putt, goes in, gets the ball. They're walking together to the 13th tee, and Hogan looks over at Claude Harmon. He says, geez, Claude, you know, I think it's the first time I ever birdied that hole. Now, Claude Harmon just had a hole in one. If you want to know what it's like being around the suit. <laughs> I've been to golf courses. <laughs> I've hit the bridge. <laughs> yes, twice. Yeah, twi- and almost twice. three. <laughs> oh, when you were standing there and you saw him just miss, I looked at you and you were ashen. <laughs> I think you thought he was going to do it again and that you were going to get hit. I was almost tempted to run up to see if any paint came off the top of the bar of the bridge. It was that close. You were, you were ashen. <laughs> All right. Oh, brutal. Hey, next half hour, Penn State football recruiting with Greg Pickle, PennLive.com. And the Patriot News, brought to you by Sunbury Motors. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now, from the Sunbury Motors studio, here's Steve Jones. All right, Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia. Routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. And uh, Kyler Murray, by the way, did sign his contract with the Oakland A's. But he is going to play football for Oklahoma this fall. Their comparisons are lofty in Oakland. They look at him as a potential Ricky Henderson. That's lofty. And we'll find out how he develops as a baseball player. As a football player, he'll be the starting quarterback at Oklahoma. Look, they did take an insurance policy out on him, so there I mean there is an insurance policy, and Scott Boris's agent did confirm that. Uh look, I think when it comes to this Aren't you going to get a happier, more satisfied employee when the team looks at you and says, you know, sure, we're gonna, we'll, we'll let you do this. You know, and then once you, once you get to us, throw your heart and soul into it. I think you're just going to get a better, a better player in the end because he, he wants to be there. He wants to be there. I think it's really important. But he did sign his deal um, for $4.7 million. But it sounds like he's not going to play. It sounds like he's going to play baseball this summer. I think if he did, one of the stops might be Vermont, which, of course, Vermont's going to be playing here. Um,. Um, in July, and I, you know, I don't think uh, I think he'll still be working on football. I guess that that's that's the deal. He sounds like he's going to take the time off, so he gets about four point six million dollars, and he goes from there. He hit two ninety six. I mean, he played in the Cape Cod League, and that didn't. I mean, that he only hit one seventy in the Cape Cod League, and he said, "Look, he said I learned the value of what a base hit means." the Cape Cod League. Brian in Elysburg. How are you today, Brian? Hi, Brian. Hi, Steve. Hello, how are you Brian? doing? I'm well, Brian. How are you? Okay. Hey, it's great to see uh, Nick Dunn from Shikalimi doing great with the spikes. Yeah, he's off to a good start. I mean, I think he yeah, would yeah. not be satisfied. I don't think he would not be satisfied with how he's hit the first three games, but the spikes as a team haven't hit well. 
But you know yeah. what, Brian? He looks like he's a, he looks like he's a really good prospect, and he handles himself really, really well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very happy for him because that was great to see him in the uh, paper and all that. Hey, just yeah. real quick, and then I'm going to let you go. Uh, mm-hmm. I know there's been a lot of talk in there with the Mets because you know more than likely the season's done with them. So you think they're if they trade somebody like uh, you know if they you know if they trade Bruce and all them, yeah, uh, uh, I could see him traded the Grom. I mean, no, not the Grom. They got to keep the Grom. If anybody you're going to trade, don't trade the Grom. They got to keep him because he's a franchise pitcher. And well, I wouldn't. Syndergaard, I wouldn't. Tra- Syndergaard, I wouldn't trade. You know, I wouldn't trade either Syndergaard or Degrom. I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm t- I, my point has been over and over again. When you have yeah. an established player, you stick yep. with the established player. Prospects. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry that you are now uh, selling a bill of goods to your fans. Look at the prospects yeah. we got. Most fans don't even know who they are. Yeah. Hey, I have a question, real quick. Hey, um, mm-hmm. I was talking to some of my friends, you know, they're Philly fans, right? And mm-hmm. they said, would you take Jay Bruce for uh, Mikel Franco? And they said, yeah. Then this way to move Crawford to third base. Uh, I would move Mikel Franco. Uh, ultimately, I'd like to see the Phillies do a sign-and-trade yeah. with uh, with uh, Manny Machado. But I agree oh, yeah. completely with Chuck Hickson. You don't want to give prospects up for a guy that's going to be with you too much. You want to make sure you can sign him long term. Yeah, I think I think he's going to go to the Cubs because when I saw it on the, over the weekend with the uh, baseball tonight, the guy was thinking he'll go to the Cubs. So could well, be. We'll see what although there was a there was a sign held up in the ballpark, you know, acquire Manny yeah. Machado, and it turned out it would happen to be a, an employee of the radio station that carries the games. So yeah. that didn't yeah. give me a lot of credence as to legitimacy there. That's right. Well, all I can say, it's a great time of the year. All-Star game will be here, and before you know it, yep. we talk about Penn State again. Can't wait. Absolutely, <laughs> Brian. Look forward to it. That's right. And the NFL will be here, too. And, hey, well, it's going to be tough for the Eagles, but you never know. You never know the crazy NFL. We know that. So. so it's always better to be the defending champion. That means you won. Yep. And the deal is, I'll definitely talk to you before the uh, football season, and I'm coming to the Kent State game, and then we'll talk to you. Look forward to seeing you at that game. I look forward to talking to you again soon, Brian. Thanks so much. Yep. yep. And have a happy Fourth of July, buddy. God bless you all. Yep. You got happy, it, buddy. Happy Fourth yep. of July to you too. Thank you. All right. Now let's keep the theme going with football. Let's bring in Greg Pickle, PennLive.com, and the Patriot News. These have been important recruiting weekends. So let let me talk. Let's talk about the calendar first of all, Greg. What impact has that had as to how schools and Penn State go about their business at this time of the year? Yeah, you know, it's been a bit of a race because previously you had a whole bunch of time in July to go about your business when it came to recruiting camps and having guys on this little ash bash. Penn State's big recruiting weekend of the summer was always geared around Lift for Life, but now uh, you have a recruiting dead period in there. You have some time where it's built in for the coaches to get away. I think that's probably one of the reasons Lift for Life was moved around this year and off of that Arts Fest weekend. But, yeah, I mean, it certainly has made the month of June a bit of a cram because you're trying to get all of your camps in on campus you're trying to get out to satellite camps in different parts of the country florida and virginia are just a few of the places that penn state hit in this current year so you're trying to do all of that you're running around you know bringing bringing in your true freshman to campus i believe there's what probably four guys that aren't on campus yet the rest of the class of 2018 has already arrived so i mean you sort of put it all together and i think that it's you know probably been one of the more stressful junes that most coaching staffs have ever had and don't get me wrong uh James Franklin and his staff have been proactive in doing as much as the rules allowed them to do when it came to running at this time of year and being with their players and all that. So it may not be as much of a a change or as uh, much of a, you know, more hectic time than what some other schools that maybe were less, uh, less willing to spend a lot of their June working and recruiting uh, are finding it at this point in time. But certainly uh, it's a bit of a mad dash because once that dead period hit the official visit season going on as well, on official visits now that the new NCAA rules are allow the juniors, uh, you know, senior to be prospects, current juniors from April 1 until the end of the month here. So closer to that last day where kids can do that. But ultimately, it's been a, a mad dash. And I think everyone's probably looking for a little bit of a breather on that Penn State staff. And it's coming here. Uh, how have the official visit them? And have they been really, in your opinion, on track with the number of commitments they're getting? 
Well, they are now. They certainly caught up. I know there were a lot of uh, fans that, that were worried about where Penn State was heading into the play. They were in a drought. There's no question about it. But you bring up the calendar in the first question, Steve, and I think that was why Penn State was a little bit slow to get near double-digit commitments. They sit at nine as we talk here in the middle of June. But they were at two there for quite some time, and the last one came uh, during the 2017 football season before Caden Wallace pulled the trigger and became number three at the blue-white game, and then things really got rolling from there. So uh, I think that yeah, Penn State is now where it needs to be, and we'll see decisions probably coming up not too far from now, that you know, whether they feel like they're in a good spot or not, or whether they feel like they you know, have some work to do. I mean, don't get me wrong, but they love all nine guys that they have, but when you look at the tight end spot, Jaleel Billingley, the Illinois tight end, it seems to be just close to ending his process according to his father. He saw Florida, he's seen Penn State, and he just comes off a visit to Alabama. He looks ready to decide soon. Penn State hoping to land him again, he's a tight end from Illinois. It's going to be tough to hold off Bama, though. It seems like they've made a pretty big big jump with him. John Metzi's in another guy, four starters out of Washington, sorry, out of Maryland, and again, he's one that once Josh, Josh Gaddis got down to, uh, got down into the area there at Alabama and started recruiting, he put Metzi on his watch list, and he was obviously recruiting him very hard at Penn State. Looks like an Alabama-Penn State battle for him, so we'll see how that plays out, but overall, they should feel good about where they are. They have a nice group of kids already committed. They're in pretty good spot with a number of top targets. So I only have to almost see whether that happens for some guys soon and other guys much later down the road. The ability to dominate the state uh, comes in cycles because it just depends on what the talent is within the state and the depth of it during the course of a year. All the names you were mentioning were out-of-state guys. How important is regional recruiting become in this particular year? Well, I mean, I think that you're exactly right, Steve, that it's it's different every single year. You know, you look at what Penn State's done in Virginia, and they've cleaned up down there. They have Devin Ford, they have Brandon Smith, and I think that, you know, when all things considered, some years you're going to get hot in states, and other years you're going to be ice cold in them. I always point back to what Michigan did in the state of New Jersey when Jim Harbaugh first got there, and he brought Chris Partridge in, and they pretty much ran New Jersey and got whatever they wanted there for about a year and a half, and then things evened out. So, it's not necessarily a guarantee. Hakeem Beeman from Virginia is also committed to this class uh, for Penn State as well. So it's not always a guarantee that you're going to recruit super well. Look at this class. It is pretty much regional, not necessarily the same states over and over again that Penn State's hammered since James Franklin got here. You can obviously note quickly that there's two Pennsylvania kids in the class, uh, two New Jersey kids, three Virginia, Connecticut. So you can make the, the case that the core of this class is going to be regional, but Penn State also has a ton of lines in the water outside of the region. And I think a day the power programs are very good at developing a mix where they get most of their kids close to home and then they go out and get some big name talent from out elsewhere. Penn State's able to do that in this class would obviously be one more step forward and don't get me wrong James Franklin and Penn State are very far down the road when it comes to recruiting with the big boys but to take that next what you need to do dominate your area whether it's your state or your region and then go from there and get guys from out of the region that are highly regarded. Give us a quick preview of what you see this weekend. Yeah, the whiteout camp will be interesting because Penn State obviously is going to try and get as many of its commitments and big name prospects on campus as possible. Looks like the list for that is still coming together. Obviously, you know, you get to this time of year, and what Andy Frank said back in December, uh, when and I believe he also spoke on it again in February uh, after the the first signing day and then the original signing day, is that what's tough is you're competing against schools that want to bring a kid in on an official visit. So if a kid either officially visited your school is an uncommon or he is planning to do his official visit to your school, but he wants to see another school now, you're going to have a hard time convincing that kid to come to your camp or just to your campus for an unofficial visit when somebody else that he's considering is willing to pay the bill for him and his family to come spend two days in, in their location to try and convince them to commit. So I think this camp will be interesting. They've always, been a, they've always had a, you know, a lot of good camps at Penn State, and they have so far this year, and this camp will be very good as well. The one thing that's curious is that maybe me interested though and my understanding is that you can't take an official visit and also camp so that's another thing too if the kid wants to see you he either has to decide to do that and not camp and that puts stress on your staff to be trying to run a camp and official visits now they are clearly capable of doing it but it's just one extra thing uh, there's that element to it as well so this should be a good weekend for penn state we'll see how it turns out you can go any number of ways this is the first time i think they've done it this early so We'll see, but then you obviously roll right in the lift for life, which will be good for the program as well. What is your opinion on the new uh, rule allowing you to play four games regardless of where the four games happen to be in the schedule and still retain eligibility? 
Yeah, I think it's great. I know there's some people that think it might just, uh, you know, it may just uh, come up in the bowl game or seem like uh, Kent State, for example, where you're going to be a large favorite or as planned, then maybe you can get some guys in late. But to me, I think you can almost look at it as two ways with that group of kids in the middle, not the green light guys that are going to play 100%, not the red light guys who, for whatever reason, are not going to play at all, but that group in the middle, what do you do with them? Do you play them early and almost use it as a tryout? And if they can't cut it after four games, you say, okay, we're going to redshirt you and come back to you. play two or three games and then maybe you save something for later in the year whether it's an injury whether it's this you know someone's not performing well and you want to give one more shot to shake it up there's a lot of interesting conversations that i think will be had in the penn state coaches room because as much as they have a plan for all these things and they're obviously a very smart group of guys that will put the team in the, the best position to win you have a lot of different things to figure out a lot of depth concerns to answer and i think the end of summer camp will provide more of those answers but but at the end of the day, you're going to have to decide between uh, injury risk and the potential to need a guy to play down the road, and maybe you need him for your final three games. And if you played him for two games earlier in the year, you're going to have to pick which two you're going to use him for. Now, for Penn State, the schedule sets up in such a way that later in the year, they have some opponents run into some injuries. They probably should feel okay about what's going on. I mean, you look, Indiana is at Indiana, but it's late in the year, and then they end the season with Rutgers in May. So they should have some options, but I'll be curious to see what they do with that group in the middle of guys that maybe in previous years they would have held out for depth purposes, but now they could at least try them out if nothing else. Either way, I think it's good for the kids and for the game of football moving forward. Greg, what is your opinion on the transfer rule that they just need to notify you and when within 48 hours you have to be in the database? Yeah, you know, I really haven't seen too much reaction to that one way or the other. I think the one thing that I keep coming back to is, that, at least from my understanding, is that a conference could still put a rule in that says, you know, no Big Ten transfer can go to another Big Ten team or no SEC kid can go to another SEC school. So in that respect, I think there's still uh, some wiggle room to block kids from going to a school or a team that they want to go to. So, I mean, I guess if you have to have a trade-off and see that so many fear, I can understand that to a degree. But, yeah, you know, I, I don't see any problem with it. I think that, again, you know, you're going to have some give and take. I'm sure some coaches don't like it at all, but they love that the kids can come in and play right away and they can sort of manage the roster that way as well. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's a little bit of give and take for everybody in these type of things. And I think that that rule, too, will end up being a big deal and a positive for the kids as well. Greg Pickle, PennLive.com and the Patriot News. Greg, thanks so much. Appreciate the time. We'll come back, wrap it up in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Sunbury Motors. The ESPN show Get Up with uh, Mike Greenberg, Jalen Rose, Michelle Beadle is really struggling to get a toehold. Uh, last Friday, they had 196,000 viewers. ESPN feels they need to have 300,000 or more viewers to make it sustainable. Uh, and, well, let's face it, uh, they. The football season might be a make or break for that show. Um, it is a show that when they get to football season, again, let's repeat who's on the panel. Mike Greenberg, Michelle Beadle, and Jalen Rose. Okay, Exactly which one of them is going to knock your socks off on an everyday basis as a panelist talking about college football and pro football? It's a problem for them. I think they hope that they could roll in one individual after another in the fall to do this. You know, no, you know, you know, you're on one day, you're on another day, you're on Wednesday, you're on Thursday, you're on Friday. But when, the, but the hope was that they would have a toehold and they'd be clearing three hundred thousand viewers now. Uh, 196,000 is not good for a national show. In fact, it would be termed in some areas as awful. And that morning show has to set the table. I mean, it's it's like that in any business. I mean, let's 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 be honest about it. 
what Mark Lawrence does to start the day here on WKOK sets sets a tone for what I get to do. You you, you get in your car, you turn on Mark's show, you listen to the show, and then when you get back in the car, our show's on. That's because he set the table. Now, hopefully, we're good enough at what we're doing in the afternoon that it's still on WKOK when you get up and listen to him. But that's what the morning does. Yeah, and there's a reason why from time to time you hear Mark on this show talking about, hey, what's coming up tomorrow? Yeah. Already setting the scene for the next day. Exactly. Our so you're trying, yeah. right, you're trying to cross-promote. Sure. And ESPN can't have a show that's getting 196,000 people to set the tone for the day. Can't do it. And I don't know how many times have you seen it. A few, t- a, a few times here and there, just out of curiosity. The one time, though, I did tune in. Uh, Greeny was in studio, and the other two that were filling in uh, with Mike Greenberg were, uh, do, 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 I want to say it was Maria Taylor and uh, Jason. Do, 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 uh, from the college basketball coverage, the former Duke player. Oh, okay. Call on college basketball game day. Uh, Jay Williams. Jay Williams. Jay Williams. Yeah, it was Jay and Maria. They were filling in. But it was the either the day of or a travel day with the NBA Finals. Because that brings up a great point because Michelle Beadle and Jalen Rose are part of NBA pregame, NBA halftime, and... I don't know. Yeah. It, that's a problem. I mean, look, live sports drives drives a sports network. I mean, that be that's not exactly profound. But 196,000 viewers for a national morning show. Uh, that's not good. That's not good. That's 4,000 viewers per state. Hmm. You're listening to News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury. You can hear us anywhere in the world with the Sunbury Broadcasting Corporation app.